Hello and welcome to today's 12th WIEF Global Discourse on Digital Transformation and the Future of Education. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's welcome our moderator for this session, Azlina Kamal, from UNICEF Education Specialist Malaysia. And the floor is all yours, Azlina. Thank you very much, Ina. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome once again to the 12th WIEF Global Discourse on Digital Transformation and the Future of Education. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a colossal impact on the education and learning of children. We know that the great majority of the world's school children, some 1.6 billion at the peak of the crisis, which is approximately 91% of the world's enrolled students have been out of school. And you know, with over 400 million children globally without access to online learning. And this has left education systems, parents, teachers, and children themselves grappling with the new realities of education during and post pandemic. So these disruptions to the education system since early 2020 have already driven substantial losses and inequalities in learning, dis disproportionately affecting the most marginalized children and exacerbating pre existing inequities. Um, even before COVID 19, uh, we know there's been high adoption of education technology with global ed tech investments reaching US 18.66 billion in 2019. And the overall market for online education forecasted to reach US uh, 350 billion by 2025. So, because of the pandemic, we've seen that there's been a significant surge in the use of innovative technological uh, solutions powered by AI, providing improved opportunities uh, for student interaction and collaboration. Um, and so today, um, we wanted to, uh, to kind of discuss um, this whole idea of prioritizing education recovery, because we know it is crucial in order to build a more resilient and inclusive education system whilst at the same time um, averting a generational catastrophe with a lost COVID generation. So I'm sure you would agree that the topic today is particularly relevant and opposite uh, digital transformation and the future of education. So to discuss our uh, topic today, we have very, uh, two very esteemed speakers. Um, we have uh, Dr. Mohammed Helmi Norman, who is the Deputy Director, uh, Center of Teaching and Curriculum Development uh, from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia. And we're also very privileged to have Dr. Augustus Sinakos, Professor and Director of the Advanced Educational Technologies and Mobile Applications Lab um, from the International Hellenic University, Greece. So welcome Dr. Helmi and Prof. Uh, Augustus. Um, to the session today. We are, we're very excited um, to have you both. And since time is of the essence, I will dive straight into it and um, invite um, Dr. Helmi to give his introductory remarks on the topic today. Over to you, Dr. Helmi. Thank you, uh, Ms. Azlina Kamal, uh, moderator for today, uh, fellow distinguished panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Augustus Sinakos. Uh, we uh, from Greece and um, WIEF uh, Secretariat, ladies and gentlemen. So, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today, um, this afternoon. Um, I'm very excited to be uh, with everybody today. So, responding to what um, uh, Ms. Azalina was, was saying just now about um, equity. So, of course, um, uh, when relating to that, I think uh, we uh, put equity, we can place equity um, on a continuum. So um, it, it's, it's related to the digital divide. And on the far side, we can see, you know, the marginalized and uh, underprivileged communities provide. So I think, of course, providing access to education is crucial. And on the other hand, we also have to think about preparing students that um, uh, for the needs of the fourth industrial revolution. So I think it's, it's, it's too 
you know, um, very huge continuums of uh, digital divide. And then, you know, suddenly we are hit with COVID-19, causing the digital divide to be larger. So in, uh, maybe in response to this, um, in higher ed, uh, what we did is uh, we moved from face-to-face uh, -face and blended learning. So, um, you know, in higher education context, uh, so we moved from face-to-face -face blended learning. We, we had that ecosystem there, but um, suddenly we had to move to full-blown online learning. How do we do this? How do we, you know, know the, the, the environment is, is ready for half blended, you know, online, face-to-face, uh, -face, but now suddenly everything's online. Yes, we had to change policy. We had to change environments. And then uh, the Ministry of Education uh, uh, previously had the e-learning policy 1.0, 2.0, uh, which, you know, uh, moving towards blended learning. But again, we had to, uh, you know, create new guidelines for online learning, online assessments were introduced and going to the lower education where the Ministry of Education introduced um, uh, DELIMA or Digital Educational Learning Initiative. Um, uh, Azvina was me uh, with the talk uh, back then in, in, in June 2020. So it was the first online learning environment in collaboration with Apple, Microsoft, and Google. But again, so 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 this is this is um, uh, for the well. It was planned before the pandemic, and then suddenly the pandemic happened, and um, it was there. But again, so uh, you know, I think I would like to. Um, take to consideration the most difficult issues, challenges um, that uh, was faced by educators, lecturers, teachers, students, parents, was to sort of um, accept change. And then how do how do we you know we're we're so used to teaching you know face to face some some bits of online here and there, and then suddenly moving towards something new. I would like to. Uh, quote uh, Professor Bruce Tuckman and um, his, you know, uh, four stages of change. So inform, uh, so, so in change, informing something, um, you always go to the for, first phase, which is form, and then moving to storm. Oh, how do I use this? How do I do Zoom? How do I do, how do I use, you know, iPad in teaching and learning? Oh, I've never used iPads anymore. And then, and then you move to the norming oh this is easy yeah i can do this oh, i understand the ecosystem and then eventually you move to performing which is the fourth phase so i think now you know it has been one or two years um since the pandemic go entering the second year uh, actually i think now is the time for us to perform because we understand now how it works and then now uh, from blended learning uh, now moving to fully online learning and then now suddenly hybrid learning all these types of learning, but I think um, understanding the affordance of all these learning environments, learning modes is uh, crucially important to sort of bridge the gap, bridge the, that digital gap that I was uh, telling you uh, at the first place. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I think again, um, equity, uh, you place it on a continuum, but you know, I mean, closing that digital gap, uh, the, the digital divide, because of course, um, we have the marginalized over here, and then we have also the, the students who are, you know, marginalized also because education is is, is suddenly changed. So I think um, bridging that gap is uh, would be uh, very interesting in, in moving towards that. And we have to, um, you know, uh, constantly uh, prepare our students again, not just for COVID, uh, post-COVID and also the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution, which I will uh, be talking about later. Back to you, Azina. Thank you so much, Helmi, for that introductory statement. Uh, I think you've highlighted some really important points about, you know, equity and the digital divide and how, um, you know, keeping that in mind um, at the forefront of uh, our discussions on digital transformation um, is important. And, you know, in, in terms of capturing this uh, future of education where everybody can have a stake in that future. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll come back to you later with, with some of the questions um, on, on this topic further. Um, and uh, I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Augustus 
uh, to also provide his um, introductory remarks um, on reflections um, on the topic today. Um, and um, it'll be interesting to listen to the case of Greece in terms of the um, uh, response and uh, the challenges during the COVID pandemic. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my regards from the sunny Greece. Uh, thank you for the invitation and I'm quite uh, honored being invited and participating in such an event. So uh, my regards to you and uh, your audience as well. Um, I have to start by saying that um, um, I've been involved with distance education for more than 25 years now. And um, I can surely state that um, uh, during this pandemic, we realized that nobody was well prepared for this shift. And this includes not only the educators, includes the, the infrastructure system of every country, includes the providers, the big companies uh, that provides online services. So everybody was really surprised about this because it happens globally at the same time. And that was an, an uh, unknown event prior to the COVID. The demands uh, for, on, for accessing online learning was something that nobody has experienced uh, before. So it was a big surprise for everybody. And for sure, no one was very well prepared, even those who have been working with distance education and online learning for, more, for many years, because nobody has uh, encountered this high demand. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm saying this uh, for the educators who might felt uncomfortable on using those tools. And I have to say, you don't have to do, to feel such in such a way. Nobody was very well prepared. And one of the comments that I have to make initially is that um, f as a result of this shift uh, from uh, online, from face-to-face -face school to online schools, and, and I'm talking for all the levels of education, including prior uh, education, secondary and higher education, um, there was a big of surprise for students, for teachers, and for parents as well, okay? And um, even university professors were not prepared about this because, okay, you might be a very experienced teacher uh, teaching face-to-face, uh, -face, but uh, how about just moving suddenly in less than one month to online teaching? It's a, a totally different ecosystem, it requires a totally different set of material set of tools to use and how you practice a different pedagogy. So uh, there, are, there were a lot of uh, open questions that nobody was prepared to answer because the variety of the target audience was really enormous. Uh, uh, so nobody performed very well on this globally, I can say, at least at the very beginning. And um, Something that um, um, really is uh, worth mentioning here is that for us who are dealing with the research of distance education, this was a big case study to see the affordance of its technology because we've been working with distance education, blended learning, high flex models, uh, hybridic learning, and all these different, uh, let's say, definitions of the mixture of face-to-face -face and online schools or, or online education. But nobody has tested so far the real affordance of its technology. For example, uh, right now that the whole, uh, um, let's say, fuss is a bit over and we are a bit experienced or more familiar, let's say, not experienced, but a bit more familiar on this shift uh, of uh, environments. The big questions remain, when to use blended learning or online technology and when to use face-to-face -face because there is no specific mode of education that can provide everything. Uh, I think that uh, a big lesson from this uh, shift was that its approach has its limitations. The big questions, uh, one of the big questions is where to find the balance. And this includes not only teachers, but also learners as well. For example, 
youngsters uh, uh, approaching the school for the first year uh, was really surprised because they were expecting to be part of the uh, school environment, interact with their uh, uh, young students and this uh, community, this uh, school society that everybody has experienced so far. But instead of this, they were looking at the screen for many hours. Okay, this is not distance learning. This is a remote emergency teaching and has nothing to do with distance learning. I can say that this shift has damaged the image, the profile of distance learning, because uh, there were many cases of poor performance of distance education here. Okay. On the other uh, side, uh, as uh, Helmi has already mentioned, uh, there was a big surprise for the teacher how to use the technology. I'm not well prepared. And this provide an extra level of difficulty for them. Uh, um, if there are educators among uh, our audience, uh, they may recall the first day they enter the class. Lack of ex prior experience on how to teach provide them, uh, they had an extra anxiety. Can, can I perform well? How I can do this? Okay, the same situation happened to everybody, even for those teachers that were uh, on service for more than 20 years because everybody was a newbie in this shift, okay? Uh, and that was a unique experience, experiment because we, have, we had, uh, let's say, students and teachers at the same level of novelty and, uh, you know, trying to, to do their best on both sides, okay? So I think uh, all these um, uh, issues uh, were very new and nobody was prepared uh, to deal or solve or provide, let's say, global solutions. Even the big companies that provided, let's say, many services like uh, Google or Zoom, uh, they, they had to do major upgrades, uh, major modifications, okay? Uh, but again, I think it's in, in our uh, humankind to, to find uh, um, what is the best out of this adventure, what we have to learn and how to use those benefits uh, for a better future in education or how to avoid similar mistakes, okay? So uh, I think that's my initial comment uh, uh, to your question and um, let's see how the discussion evolves. Thank you very much, uh, Augustus, for that um, initial remarks, right? I think I noted a few um, themes that both Helmi and you have highlighted in terms of that change, right? I think we underestimate the many layers and levels of change. So while we were all experiencing this shock to the education system um, during, you know, the change, so there was a change in terms, not just um, the education system and how learning was redefined within that space, but also the wider change of adapting and adjusting to life during COVID. And then within that, all those changes in terms of, you know, the rules and roles of engagement of teachers and learners. And you mentioned students and teachers starting at the same point. In some instances, students were far uh, greater users of technology than, than teachers were who were grappling with this, right? Um, so, you know, how do we assess learners? How do we engage them online? Um, you are absolutely right in highlighting the point that just because we put children, uh, we give them devices or they're looking at the screen doesn't mean learning is, is happening. Um, I think you both talk very um, eloquently about those multiple layers of change um, and why, you know, understanding that and unpacking that a bit more is important. Um, and also, I think both of you also highlighted the issue of real affordances of, of technology, right? I think that also needs um, a bit more re-examination. So thank you for, for highlighting those um, two important points. I would just like to uh, remind our audience, um, you know, please um, send us your questions. Um, it's still very quiet on the um, Q&A. Uh, do we have any questions yet? Not yet. So uh, please, uh, you know, don't be shy. Uh, we are all looking forward to, to engage. It's a dialogue. Um, so we all want to have that learning conversations. Please feel free to, to share your insights or if you have any questions that you would like to ask our 
speakers today. So while we are waiting for our audience to, you know, to share their reflections, I wanted to pick up on the point on um, equity again, right? So we are we are now talking about digital transformation. You know, it's a learning curve for everybody. We're trying to understand the different affordances. We're trying to cope with this change. Everybody is trying to understand their role within this change. We're trying to look at this future. Uh, what will this future mean for all of us? Um, I, I just wanted you to unpack a bit more, right? So um, if we're talking about a future where we're, we're discussing digital transformation, how... Uh, in your opinion, can this digital transformation happen for everyone, for every child, right? Because we know that the gap between, um, you know, access to technology, uh, we know uh, a quarter of the world's children don't have access to any gadgets, for example. Um, even in Malaysia, one, uh, one in three children don't have access. So how do you foresee, in terms of the work that you've done um, and what you've seen during the pandemic, how do we... Um, uh, contextualize this digital transformation and that future that we want um, by uh, taking into account uh, issues related to equity and inclusion. Um, I'll start with uh, maybe um, since we started earlier with tell me, shall we go to you first, uh, Augustus? Yes, it's fine. Um, I think there are two big uh, questions here, not just one, uh, Selina. One is the um, kind of future actions for, for the future, which is another topic. And the first question is the equity of uh, accessing technology. So I will pick the first one, and then I will leave, I think, Helmi to reply to this, and then we will come back to the second part, I think. Okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, bit, I'm, st I'm, stalling, uh, I'm stealing your role as a moderator here. <laughs> Sorry for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. Don't worry. I'm so, happy for it. I'm happy to share it with you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, I think that um, uh, during the pandemic, um, uh, many uh, students realized that um, it's kind of different. Uh, there is a big difference between playing with mobile devices or acting uh, in social media than learning from them. Uh, it's a totally different procedure, which has its own limitations. That limitations that depends on the device and in the on, on the procedure. On the other hand, uh, talking about um, uh, ability to access those devices, that's, that was another big challenge, because even in uh, countries with uh, where the society can afford the existence of many mobile devices or laptops in a family. Let's consider a home that has an average of two or three children and the parents working together in the same home at the same time. Our homes are not designed to be as a multiple office areas. Okay, so there was a limitation there as well. All, uh, on the top of this, I think uh, one of the big challenges was the lack of uh, broadband connections. Because when you are sharing in the same uh, uh, home, the same bandwidth, multiplied by five, let's say, working together on a la uh, using live streaming, uh, it, is a, it was a demand that <laughs> was never met before. So that has also some limitations. But talking about um, uh, education, uh, and I was referring to five uh, uh, persons because I was also including parents because in many cases, not only students were studying at the same time in the morning, but also uh, the, the parents had to do their own work uh, by, uh, remotely, okay? So I, I add them also in the equation as well. So uh, uh, another big question for me as a part of the academic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, team was, uh, what has happened with students with disabilities uh, during this pandemic? Uh, I think that um, uh, lack of uh, universal design uh, uh, learning, the, the UDL, uh, let's say, uh, guidelines were totally ignored, or not totally ignored, but ignored at a, uh, at a, at, uh, a big percentage uh, from uh, educators. Uh, Students with disability, uh, with any kind of disability, uh, I think they were left behind. 
and that provide uh, us a very significant, let's say, barrier to our societies. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about uh, Greece, I'm talking uh, uh, globally, uh, because we did some researches of, uh, on how this has affected globally the educational system. And most of uh, students uh, felt alone during this shift. I don't know if somebody from your audience had a similar experience or they can share uh, the, such ideas or um, uh, th that was another uh, big issue when we are talking about uh, digital divide. Uh, and this is something that we really have to take care of for the future. Yeah. And uh, the last point uh, prior of uh, handing the floor back to you uh, was, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the lack of uh, broadband connections. And uh, I think it's the time for uh, uh, policy makers to understand that um, the provision of uh, internet should be part of the policy that stands for accessing electricity and water. So internet should be a public good and the provision of internet should be similar to the provision of water and electric electricity to the rest of the population. So that's another big point in the educational uh, landscape that somebody has to focus on. So back to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Helmi, do you, I see lots of um, interesting questions coming in in the Q&A. So thank you very much to our audience. And, and there's some comments as well in the chat. If you have questions, we'd appreciate it if you could move it to the Q&A so that people can upvote it and then we can answer those questions first. Um, Helmi, is there anything you wanted to add in addition? Yeah, thank you, Elena. And and some interesting points by uh, Augustus uh, was said in terms of playing versus learning, you know, and uh, I think ability of learning and empowerment of learning, and then home versus uh, school, university. So, so I would like to, you know, conceptualize that into uh, our university's um, active learning framework, which is, uh, you know, uh, it has three elements, which is, um, uh, pedagogy, uh, space, and also technology. So again, um, students, you know, um, live in, in, in physical and digital worlds, I think. And uh, I agree with, uh, but, 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 you know, physical and digital worlds, uh, but still uh, more of a, what do you call it, face-to-face. -face. And then uh, the, the digital is, uh, sort of, um, what do you call it, uh, you know, uh, is, 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 is a part of the physical world, but now suddenly everybody's, every, everything's shifted to digital. So how does that uh, play in mind? And, and again, I think, um, you know, uh, the, I think it's for, for the teachers also, they, uh, everybody's, uh, you know, used to, you know, teaching face-to-face. Uh, suddenly um, pedagogy, digital pedagogy, digital teaching, online learning. How do you do that? How do you engage students um, for that uh, matter? And how do you empower them um, at homes? Like for instance, um, you know, it, students uh, who had uh, digital devices, for instance, the iPad, how do I use the iPad for learning? I usually play it for games. As Augustus was saying, like playing and learning is very different. How do you uh, create content? How do you create learning materials? How do you, you know, um, uh, create assessments? Suddenly the, the whole ecosystem is, is changed. And again, um, you know, reaching to the, the uh, underprivileged, I think, again, the, the shift is different also. So, so uh, I think um, what we have to do is, is, is rethink. And um, of course, uh, you know, uh, after the, the, the you know, um, the, the, the pandemic has happened, and the uh, moving towards the post-pandemic era, we should um, have a, you know, a, we, we have a design, but I think it should be rethinked um, in ensuring that uh, we can close that gap and, you know, have that playing versus learning, you know, ability versus empowerment. And then, um, you know, the space, which is home um, and schools. How do we link that up? How do we make that, you know, cross? Um, not just uh, segmenting everything in school is you know learning is at school 
and at the university, but no, it's, it's actually um, across the continuum. Yeah, back to you again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's that's a very good point, right? How do we build that um, coherence um, and and like a um, keep it all in sync, right? Building bridges between all the the various elements. Um, I wanted to ask. So there are, there's some very interesting questions. So I'll get right onto it. So I think if um, you know, just to keep in mind, we've got uh, quite a number of questions. So I'm going to ask you for your quick reflections on on some of this. So the first question, um, the most upvoted question at the moment, um, so, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad uh, Fazli Ilahi, I wanted to know about the acceptability of grading. How can we enhance it? when students have complained about the difficulties of putting their video cameras on for a long time due to, you know, technical difficulties like device and internet uh, problems. So um, maybe Helmi, you'll take that and then I'll get uh, August just to answer the other question, the next question. Yeah, um, first of all, I think it's uh, dealing with uh, synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning. Um, of course, synchronous requires a higher bandwidth, like, like now, you know, um, everything has to be synchronous, you know, um, physical, of course, it's synchronous because you're in the classroom, assessments is, you know, synchronously done, um, teaching and learning is synchronously done, but suddenly um, you want to replicate the model online. I think, um, you know, with, with the bandwidth, with the technology difficulties, with the connectivity um, that sort of, uh, I mean, you, you have to change a bit the model to, to see the suitability of the children, of the, the students, you know, uh, moving that uh, in, towards the model of uh, continuous assessment, uh, you know, alternative assessments. Um, and, and, you know, and, and we, we, we do have models of uh, online examinations where uh, invigilation happens, but, uh, you know, the, the, the model, I think, is different. The pedagogy, the assessment is, is truly different for uh, both modes. And, you know, um, again, I, I was touching on empowerment. You know, um, how do we empower students, you know, stuck in the screens? And then how do we empower them to, to do activities? How do we assess them? So these are the, 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 the things I think um, should be looked at. Uh, in depth um, uh, in, in moving towards, you know, a better uh, online uh, or, or, or blended or, a, you know, as, as Augustus was saying, um, uh, hybrid learning, high flex learning. So uh, how do we empower and ensure that that assessments um, or, or students are, or learning is truly assessed? Yeah, I think, I think to focus on, you know, what are we trying to assess in our learners rather than, you know, do we turn on the screen or not, right? So because the, the goal is to actually assess the skills and, and, and if say putting on a camera is not one way to do that, then how do we then explore other ways in which we still assess the learning without the, uh, you know, the, the physical um, camera turning on and off. So, so thank you very much for that, Helmi. Um, the next question uh, from Lalisa uh, uh, Montenegro, um, uh, and this is for you, uh, Augustus, I'm directing it to you. Do the risk to data protection and human rights of using AI in education outweigh the benefits? And how do we safeguard the safety of ourselves and our kids, uh, especially. This is very interesting because I was the other day listening about AI and how, you know, the intelligence that's being developed. And I'm trying to be nice to Google when I say, hi, Google, because I'm afraid that, okay, I'll come back if I'm not nice because it's developing all this intelligence. So do you want to share a little bit on that, um, uh, Augustus, to Lalisa's question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can have the floor for two hours from now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I've noticed uh, kind of uh, six, seven very interesting questions in the qu uh, question and answer box. So, uh, but I will uh, stick on the one you, you addressed me as Lena. Uh, uh, just no, to you comment. Know, you know what you can do, Augustus? If you think you can combine them, then combine them and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll very quickly, that, that's a, a good way as well to kind of cover. No, no. I, I, I will keep uh, with your uh, schedule. And then if uh, some of those questions remain unanswered, I will come back. Okay. Uh, just to make a point on uh, what uh, Helmi has already mentioned about uh, online uh, examination systems. I think that was a big 
uh, issue for all the universities where the, the need for examination was mandatory. So in some, for secondary and primary education, the need of examination is, was not mandatory, or it was something that was not so crucial. Let's say, okay, at least at the early stage of uh, education, but in the universities uh, had to solve a very difficult uh, problem. And again, there is no an easy answer for this. The big question is what you would like to assess. And this shift gave us a very good example that even when uh, teach own students, uh, let's say, uh, participate in a physical examination. Okay, do we, we are all, everybody is sure that those students perform, let's say, well or poor because they don't have the skills. There are many factors that affect the performance of a students even in a face-to-face -face examination. And this is something that everybody should realize. The same happens when somebody is trying to examine them using any kind of software remotely. So the big question is what we would like to assess in the near future. The skills that somebody really has, or you would like to uh, assess the ability to recall or memorize part of the theory. So that's a big question for us to solve. And this was proven out of the lack of appropriate software to do this, okay? Of course, there are some universities, especially in Australia, that there was um, very well equipped on this, uh, and they are doing uh, online uh, exams for uh, many years now, but under the premise that in such universities, there is a specific set of employees working towards this direction, okay? You need a, a big group of, uh, of technicians to organize this setting. It's not something that can easily happen in a daytime and somebody that only a professor can do. For example, to buy a software and do this. Okay, so I'm closing this addition uh, to um, uh, Helmi's comment. And back to the question raised about um, risk for data protection. Uh, actually, I, I came across this dilemma uh, um, with two different angles, okay? One is the angle of the, of the uh, student. Uh, there was a big anxiety on parents' uh, part on how should I treat the case where my uh, six-year-old son stands in front of the computer uh, participating in a video conference and I'm not there with him. What happens to the video? What happens to his face? because somebody can easily crop uh, 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 a frame and use it for any kind of purposes, okay? Uh, but also, there is a different angle on this. Uh, I don't know if somebody has already considered it, but I, I came across these uh, cases uh, in, in Europe where uh, students uh, took this advantage and used them as a blackmail to, to a teacher uh, claiming that somebody has harassed them, okay, in order to achieve better grading or to achieve any kind of issue. So there are both sides to look at it. And, and of course, there is a big dilemma. Can I, for, ex for example, record these sessions, which this decision, uh, let's say, causes a number of uh, sequent uh, steps because you need specific storage, specific permission to do this, how are going to treat the data later on? So I think here uh, the answer to all this is, or one of the answers that somebody can uh, provide is, uh, it's not a good policy, especially for young people, to participate in a standalone uh, mode in a video conference face-to-face -face with any adult, even if that is a, a teacher. That's my suggestion. Pick up group sessions where other uh, students are also present. So there is, uh, let's say, um, lack, uh, you minimize the risk of uh, such behaviors. Uh, on the other hand, because um, uh, there was a mention in the um, uh, artificial intelligence technology interfering to this, uh, prior of commenting the artificial intelligence, I have to, to bring an example here and ask uh, audience and even you, 
uh, Aslina, uh, do you have a, uh, a safety uh, locker in your kitchen? No. Or, or if the audience, some of the audience, can you, can you reply to us if somebody has a, a, a safety locker in your kitchen? Or help me, do you have a uh, safety locker in your, in your kitchen, in the door of your kitchen? Lalisa says no. Um... Okay. Uh, Masha, so, no. So, so what this has to do with uh, our question, eh? this is a, another big question. Well, you should, because in the kitchen, uh, you have many knives, correctly? Is that correct? Eh? So typically, uh, your children can easily pick up a knife during the night and kill you. Isn't that the case? But then why you don't have a, a locker in your kitchen? The, the, the answer is quite uh, obvious, because you educate your children that the use of knife has, has different aspects. We use knife to eat our food, not to kill people, because if you do this, there are some consequences and you are getting hurt and you can easily get hurt other people. Okay, so we are based on the education that we provide to our children in order to avoid such behaviors. So the answer relies in this premise. We have to educate ourselves and our children how to avoid such behaviors. Because whatever we do, even if we employ artificial intelligence, any kind of sophisticated technology, always there will be another area where we are missing part of the information. So there is a leaking point in all this, let's say, safety, guards that we can surround our children and ourselves. The issue here is how to educate them to perform well in those dangerous situations and how to recognize them and avoid them. And this brings us to the media literacy issue, but uh, or the uh, digital divide issue in terms of the context of uh, accessing the internet. And the, my last point for uh, artificial intelligence, I think, the, the interference of artificial intelligence has, um, has also uh, two ways to look at it. One is that um, for, I have to say that uh, the use of technology is neutral, depends on the um, intentions of the human user. Okay. Uh, if you use artificial intelligence, let's say to spy on people uh, and provide uh, appropriate content for uh, commercial reasons, well, this can happen and many other things can happen, okay? But if you use AI in order to help people to learn better and let's say adjust the content according to the preference of the student, according to the, the, let's say the, uh, the, the age of the, of the, the learner, then uh, we are, us as the teachers, we have a very strong partner in, in teaching because we are, we are became a mentors. We are becoming mentors during the process of teaching and learning, rather than just providing information and repeating the same theory again and again. So, it's a it's a very good question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we, I'm just conscious because we have more questions. I'm trying to to give everybody's uh, question a chance to be answered. Uh, so thank you very much for that very thorough explanation. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Faiza, I think that answers your question as well, because we talked about um, um, assessment uh, in terms of um, uh, in the universities. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, Hassan has a question, uh, Helmi, on, um, you know, in terms of technologies, there is always an extra cost when it comes to, to, to accessing technologies. How can you know, we ensure poor villages, for example, to afford this? So again, it goes uh, back to the issue of affordability and um, technology. Do you, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Zina, and uh, uh, everybody for that question. Yeah, uh, whew, yeah hard question. But I think, of course, um, you know, education is a always you have to um, there's always cost um, uh, involved. For instance, for a physical um, university or a school, you will uh, you would have to go to school um, using a car. So cost, you'd have to build a building cost. OK, 
uh, the classes cost. And um, for online learning to happen, you have to, uh, the car is the internet, actually. Okay, if you don't have internet, it's kind of hard. You, you can do it, but, um, you know, uh, it's like a car, okay? And then um, the learning space. So the learning space is in the physical environment is the school and the university. And here you have, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, in Malaysia, it's the Lima. And then you have the learning management system. You have, you know, um, iTunes U, you have uh, Google Classroom, you have, you know, Microsoft Teams and, 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 and all the learning spaces. So cost also, actually. So I think uh, in, 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 of course, um, in ensuring, you know, education is, uh, you know, um, equitable, is, is, is reached out. Uh, of course, there's cost somewhere. So, so it's about, uh, you know, putting um, the, 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 you know, the cost to the right place. For, for instance, you know, putting, putting, putting that into towards technology because, you know, you, if you don't have internet, you can't reach the, 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 you know, the classroom. If you don't have a car, you won't be able to reach the, the university or, or, or school. So I think, of course, um, there has to be a rethink, a rethought about how uh, we can integrate um, online learning, distance learning, blended learning, hybrid, high flex. Of course, uh, cost is, is a very important factor, but prior, prioritizing which, I mean, where the cost goes to, I think is important thing in ensuring that um, education is uh, sustainable and equitable. Yeah, I think um, also, I think, you know, you know, from a UNICEF perspective, we're also calling um, for educational investments and financing to be uh, maintained, right? Because what we also don't want is as a result of COVID because of competing demands financially that, you know, there will be budget cuts um, as a result to, um, to education um, and, and how um, it can be refinanced. So there's a, there's a poll here. Uh, in what type of learning environment do you prefer to learn? Uh, so the host and the panelists cannot vote. So, um, you know, audience, uh, we would very much um, uh, welcome you to, to vote for this. So you've heard uh, quite a lot of uh, input. So we also now want to, want to hear a little bit from you and your, your thoughts. Uh uh, Selena, may I comment on a question that I uh, came across the question and answer box? Yeah, yeah, okay? go ahead. While, okay. we're, while our audience is on the poll. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions regarding the affection of uh, this kind of uh, uh, screen time that has to the children. And uh, what about uh, healthy considerations? And uh, if this shift will affect uh, children in the way they learn. So I was trying to combine all these questions under those two topics. Um, and I will start from the healthy issues uh, that uh, may occur. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, especially young students uh, were really surprised because suddenly uh, from one uh, side, from one day, uh, everybody was hearing from their parents don't use the uh, laptop so many hours, don't stay in front of the computer for so many hours, go out and play and all this stuff. And suddenly the, the, the next day, they had to spend, I would say more than six hours uh, yeah. in front of a screen. And this was part of their life and became a, a mandatory obligation for them. Okay, so <laughs> there was a big confusion in their minds. Of course, this uh, uh, has a, an impact to their physical ability uh, of staying in front of the computer and uh, uh, reading from a screen, or even, uh, let's say, nobody of us can st stay in front of the TV and watch a movie for six hours, okay? So how we expect our children to do the same? So this is a, a major, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, indication that something is wrong here, okay? We, ca we cannot uh, shift the, the whole program of the school from the physical environment to an online environment. You have to do a different setting. For example, you have to do to use synchronous sessions with your classroom, not to provide again the same lectures that you're gonna do online, but just to interact with them, solve questions and to provide uh, further, let's say, uh, um, um, questions for, for them to understand, for better comprehend the, con the, uh, uh, the context and not 
to try to, uh, let's say, uh, copy the process of lecturing face to face, but you were doing the same using your camera because students are not prepared for this. And you have to leave some space from them to move around, to get out of the to to to, to, to get out of their desk and their room and and uh, uh, do something different. So of course this has a, a risk, not uh, only for their eyes because. Even my eyes became quite dry after working for 10 or 16 hours in front of a laptop. Uh, but this is something that I choose to do. Nobody can force the children to do the same. So we, th we have to think seriously about this. And again, about if this shift will uh, uh, affect children, I will say definitely yes, for, and for good and for bad. For good because let's say, uh, they learn during the pandemic how they can learn themselves, the, how they can explore different resources. So that made them, let's say, more mature learners because when the, the, the teacher was talking, they were able to search the internet, find different resources or communicate with their peers and uh, uh, exchange ideas. So they became more autonomous during the learning process. But also uh, on the other hand, if Nobody put some restrictions on this or some rules. Those, uh, all those facilities that they should upgrade the educational session became factors of distractions for them. So in case um, the lecture was not so interesting, they can easily mute the camera or the microphone and in, uh, initiate a chat <laughs> and discuss different topics, okay? Uh, it, there are common uh, examples across the globe about this. So again, you need to find the best solution. Risks are everywhere, but the, the issue here is how to make best use of what we learned so far, either to teach online or to teach face to face. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've covered, I think, um, three or four questions um, uh, uh, on, on this. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we've got about like, you know, seven more minutes. And so I want to kind of um, uh, also get both of you to, while you're doing your uh, concluding uh, remarks, uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've browsed through some of the questions. Maybe, you know, you can talk a little bit about, you know, some of the emerging themes about um, risk and threats um, and how do we get, uh, you know, universities or education institution um, to look at this and navigate the risk. Um, another theme that's coming out is on, you know, do we need to modify physical syllabus when it comes to online classes? And, you know, linking to that risk earlier, um, you know, how do we, uh, do we, do teachers need to install remote learning or device management on students' digital devices to see what they're doing? Uh, and, um, and is this, you know, having the camera on, is it not uh, breaking uh, privacy? And I think there's a comment on digital citizenship and introductory course uh, being mandatory in school. Um, given that there are many pitfalls and challenges, uh, you know, with uh, children and teenagers online. So I just wanted to summarize all these questions so that you're also aware, maybe in your, uh, in your uh, concluding remarks, you can somehow allude to some of these uh, points. So uh, can I then invite you, uh, Augustus, to, to, to simultaneously allude to some of these points highlighted as well as your uh, concluding uh, thoughts on this whole digital transformation and the future of education. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, also, it's not quite easy to summarize what has happened and what lessons are learned uh, in two or three minutes. I will do my best. Uh, so, uh, let's start that um, from the fact that everybody learned out of this shift and that includes parents, students and teachers because for example parents they realized a new role how educate how difficult it is to be an educator because during the pandemic they they, they, they 
came an IT help desk for the children, trying to help them to cope with all different problems and all these learning issues. So even parents learn something different. Teachers learn something different out of this shift. And of course, students <laughs> learn many things <laughs> out of this shift. Okay, uh, so uh, a very certain point is uh, the, the educational landscape will not be the same anymore. And at least this is my opinion. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, it's not a transformation that will uh, bring us to the starting point prior to the COVID area. No, it's a tot totally different reality. So everybody should modify and adjust to this new reality. Okay, so you need specific settings for coping with this new reality. Because let's say that uh, we treat COVID, okay, but a specific area is uh, um, hidden by uh, an earthquake or a, a disastrous fire. This necessity of, let's say, shifting from physical presence in the school to online presence still is there, even if COVID is treated. So some uh, humanity has to learn out of this, how to deal with this uh, shift, uh, shifting from one mode to another mode and get the, the best out of it. So this is the one lesson learned that this, con this situation will continue and will act complementary, not uh, one competing another. The issue here is not to prove which mode is the best, but the, the issue here is how we can get the best out of each mode, okay? Both for teachers and for, for learners. Um, the second thing that I would like to mention is that, uh, and I'm talking about the policy makers here, is that for sure they should have some actions uh, uh, to take and pick up some, let's say, measurements on how to face again and be well prepared in case such an emergency happens. And I'm talking about um, programs for edu educating educators how to cope with all these challenges. For example, in Greece, we ran a very unique experiment, uh, a training session where uh, we trained uh, almost 85,000 uh, students, uh, teachers uh, from every level of education at a personal level in less than four months. Okay, and I'm not talking about the MOOC. I'm talking about personal training for 85,000 teachers. It's a unique uh, project across uh, Europe. Okay, or even across the world in terms of the short time of training. Uh, again, uh, Europe adopts uh, um, uh, um, a framework for upgrading digital skills, which is called selfie, uh, like the selfie photos. Okay, it's selfie for schools where uh, we, uh, the intention is to promote schools to do to to achieve better digital skills, but also there is another tool recently released that is called selfie for teachers on how European teachers can upgrade their digital skills. Okay, so I think such policies, uh, although there are uh, long term investments are really uh, pointing to the correct direction, what should be done in the near future because yeah. thank, technology thank will be there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think you've you've highlighted some very critical points. Um, but you know, time is always of the essence. It's very jealous of this very fruitful and in-depth discussion. So, um, uh, Helmi, uh, again to you on the concluding remarks and maybe alluding to some of the points and questions that have been highlighted in the Q and A. Over to you. Thank you, Azina. So, very interesting points by uh, Augustus. I think. Um, yeah, uh, the, the teacher role, the learner role, the parents role, of course, um, shifting and changing. And I think um, during this time, the teacher has not just become a, a moderator, um, you know, just moderating learning, but I think uh, moving towards empowering. How do you empower, you know, um, distance learning? How do you empower online learning? How do you empower that? And, and, and uh, of course, uh, for the learner also, is not just about you know uh, learning online, but how do you uh, you know empower technology? How do you empower learning to happen actively um, in your house? Like how am I going to do this? How, how am I going to learn? So I think um, with the uh, you know uh, going with uh, um, you know uh, me as an Apple distinguished educator, so we always go for the SAMR model. So it's not just about substitution, you know. Yeah, you can just 
put this um, book and then just put it digitally. It doesn't happen that way. Oh, you can just Google everything and uh, and learning will happen. It won't. It won't. I mean, it won't do that. It, it, you can't do that in 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 different modes of learning in, in different. So I think it's moving up the ladder, uh, moving towards substitution, augmentation, and and modification. And I think it's really redefining um, what uh, you know digital uh, the digital space, the digital environment uh, can can give you. And I think um, my last point will be you know students. In, in the fourth industrial revolution, they live in not just two worlds, but three. You know, it's about uh, living in the physical world, digital world, and biological world. And, you know, crossing these three worlds, I think, is, is important um, in, in their future. And I think they would have to um, understand this well, uh, you know, in, in preparing uh, for the fourth industrial revolution, because we, we had the pandemic and then now it's, it's moving towards post pandemic. But again, um, technology is out there, fast moving, fast forwarding. And um, for, for, for us to, you know, um, lessen or uh, take the digital divide to uh, a, a, you know, um, not, not make it big anymore and, and make it small. I think uh, we have to ensure that, uh, you know, empowerment of the future education uh, crossing the physical, digital, and biological worlds uh, can happen in the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Helmi, and you know, really, thank you so much to both our you know excellent speakers who've given us a lot to uh, reflect on today um, as we begin the conversation. Uh, I think you know it's impossible, like you know, Augustus was talking about. You know, we need so much time to unpack some of these things because these are huge questions, digital transformation, future of education. But I hope that we've given you a little bit of an essence of like the different components and, and to think about the beginning of this conversation and hopefully we'll have uh, more opportunities to, to unpack this further. I'll just end uh, by saying UNICEF, is also uh, prioritizing reimagining education for every child. But I would also like to, uh, you know, let us uh, ask us to reflect that we must not, as we talk about transformation, we must not lose sight of the ultimate goal of uh, improving equity and quality for learners and communities at the heart of it. Because innovation or transformation in and of itself is not the end goal. It is a means towards our goal and it should not divert our energies in terms of striving towards that goal, which is to improve equity and quality. And on that note, um, thank you once again to both our uh, distinguished speakers and to WIEF uh, for this wonderful uh, dialogue session. I will now uh, pass you back to the uh, MC, Ina, uh, for, to conclude uh, the webinar, but thank you so much to our audience who've asked really wonderful questions and for all your inputs and, and reflections as well. Thank you. Thank you to our distinguished guests for being here today and making this webinar successful. Now, thank you to all. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. We truly hope that you have gained valuable inputs with this webinar. Now, on behalf of WIEF Foundation, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and have a great day ahead.